Hi everyone. Um, as Kenny mentioned, my name is Samantha Gibson and I am the Engagement and Use Coordinator at DPLA. And welcome to our workshop on using the Digital Public Library of America for genealogy and family history. We are thrilled to have so many of you from the genealogy community on the line. And before I hand the mic, so to speak, over to our presenters, I wanted to share a very brief introduction to who we are and what we do for those joining us who may be new to DPLA. So let's start at square one. What is DPLA? Uh, we're a relatively new project. We launched in 2013, and DPLA is a free national digital library that provides access to cultural heritage materials from libraries, archives, and museums across the United States. So another way to think about that is that we are a network of partners who have made their content available through a single website, which you can find at dp.la. Right now, we have over 13 million items from about 2,000 contributing institutions. And we're growing all the time. Here's a snapshot of what our partner network looks like right now geographically. So just to quickly walk through what we're looking at here, the yellow circles represent specific institutions that have made their content available in DPLA, like large university libraries and institutions like the National Archives, for example. The red and orange states mean that we currently have content from a broad range of institutions in that state, from local public libraries to museums to historical societies and more. The blue states are areas where we are actively developing a new partner network. So new content from these areas will be available in DPLA soon. The gray states mean that we don't, ha we don't have contributing institutions from that state yet, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a content about that state or region from other contributors, and that's where we're headed next. We're very committed to the idea of filling in the map and adding new partners and new content over the coming years. So now that I've shared a bit about how we're collecting, um, I'd like to broadly introduce what we're collecting. Our presenters will share more details about specific kinds of materials and collections that we have, particularly those that might be valuable in the context of family history research, but I wanted to share some broad ideas about what kinds of stuff you can expect to find in DPLA. So first, we broadly define our collections as cultural heritage materials. And that's a deliberately broad umbrella to encompass many diverse uh, content areas and formats. So you can expect to find everything from art to manuscripts and archival collections, oral histories, photographs, and much more as you search in DPLA. Also, all of the resources that are accessible in DPLA come from institutions where they've been selected and reviewed by librarians, curators, and archivists. So the content that you're finding has been vetted and is reliable. Um, in uh, contrast to, say, maybe a Google search where you're searching everything, anything and everything. Um, another unique element of DPLA is that we're specifically bringing together both large national institutions and smaller, more local collections in order to provide maximal access to cultural heritage materials. So if you take a look at the logos on the slide here, you can see that we're collecting content from some of the big players in the cultural heritage landscape, like the National Archives and the Smithsonian, but we're uh, also collecting from local public libraries, historical societies, and museums, and all of that content is discoverable side by side. Uh, lastly, in terms of the scope of the collections, uh, since we're co uh, collecting from US-based institutions, certainly US history and culture is a strength of our collections but there's also a substantial and significant international scope as well. Um, so one way to think of that might be that we have a little bit of everything and a lot of US history and culture. So with that brief introduction, um, I'd like to turn it over to today's presenters. Today we'll be hearing from two highly experienced genealogists, each of whom is a member of DPLA's Community Reps Program. Amy Johnson Crow is a professional genealogist and librarian who teaches family, hi family historians about resources and research methods. As a community rep, she has promoted DPLA usage by the genealogical community through webinars and videos. 
Tamika Strong is the IT Program Manager at the Georgia Public Library Service. In her spare time, Tamika enjoys the thrill of the hunt as a genealogist and spends time helping others in their pursuit of tracing their family history. As a community rep, Tamika has also worked to spread the word about DPLA to genealogy, library, and archive circles to make them aware of this great resource. So first, I will hand it over to Amy to share more about how to search and navigate in DPLA. Okay, thank you, Samantha. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. If not, I'm sure that, that Kenny or Samantha will let me know. Um, and as Samantha said, thank you for, for joining us today. I'm so excited to share so many of the things that are available on DPLA for genealogy and family history. I would like to just sort of reiterate something that Samantha just said, and that is, you know, why we should even think about DPLA. You know, when, when we have things like Google and all of the different uh, repositories that we use having online catalogs, why, why do we need one more place to go look? Well, actually DPLA is going to make a lot of our research more efficient in terms of finding these materials that we've been looking for. Because DPLA will search across the various libraries, archives, and museums that are part of the DPLA project. So you, you don't need to necessarily go to each individual uh, contributing library, archive, or museum and search to see what they have. So you're searching across multiple libraries and museums all at once including small ones that you've never heard of and would never have thought to look. Another reason why we want to use DPLA in our genealogy research is that we can find materials in unexpected places. Here is a Bible record, just as an example. If I can get my screen to work here. There we go. So here is a Bible record that I discovered using DPLA. And as we look at this Bible record a little bit more closely, we see that it lists people who were born in Texas as well as people who were born in Tennessee. But take a look at where this digitized Bible record is found. It's in the North Carolina Digital Collections. I would never have thought to look in North Carolina Digital Collections for a family Bible that's dealing with people from Texas and Tennessee. And that's one of the beautiful things about DPLA. It can help us find these records that are in places where we never would have thought to look. So when you go to the DPLA website, which is simply dp.la, there are a lot of different sections to the website that you can explore. And I encourage you to, to explore all of them. We're not going to have time to really go through and explore all of the different sections that DPLA has to offer. What I'm going to, to focus on before handing it over to Tamika is how to do some good basic searches that will give you some really good results. And we can do a really good search just from the DPLA home page. It is a very simple search box here on the main page. And you can put in any search term that you like, whether you're going to search for an ancestor's name, a location, an organization that they belong to, a topic that you want to learn more about. You know, think about it like you would think about a library catalog. What is it that you want to find out more about? Well, I wanted to see if there was anything about a man named George Skinner. So I can just simply search for George Skinner. And when I get the results, 
I see that I have 224 results that are coming back from DPLA. Now, this doesn't mean that they are all the same George Skinner. In fact, I can just kind of tell just by glancing at these that they're not all the same George Skinner. But I can see the various types of materials that I could find in DPLA. So this is just your basic results screen, just from doing that basic search. And over on the right-hand side of the page, you'll see little thumbnails that are just smaller versions of the materials that your search has found. So here at the top of the page, we have various digitized photographs. But as we scroll through the results, we see other types of materials, including a digitized advertisement. There is uh, text material but that's correspondence. We have more digitized photographs. We have digitized correspondence. We can actually see the, the real letter. We can see a digital copy of that correspondence between George Skinner to Levy Jane and Elizabeth Skinner back in 1918. And when you do your searches on DPLA, you'll find any number of types of materials that that the contributing libraries and archives have, have made available through DPLA. So once we have these results, what do we do with them? Well, let's say that we're interested in this particular photograph of George T. Skinner. You can simply click on that thumbnail, and it will give you a more full record about that particular resource that you have found. Well, this is all well and good. I mean, I can see where this, this photograph came from. In this case, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. We see a description. We see that it's a, that it's a photograph. We have various subject headings. But the real magic is when we go ahead and click the link to see this full resource on the library or archive that made it available. So I can click this link. And it takes me off of DPLA, in this case, to the North Carolina Digital Collections, who has this digital photo. So again, DPLA doesn't host any of these items. It's helping you find them. It's pointing your way toward these wonderful resources. So now that I'm here on the website of the North Carolina Digital Collections, I can use their image viewer and I can download, I can zoom in, and, and see this handsome World War I soldier and find out more about him. Now, as genealogists, our first instinct is to search by name, just like I did with searching for George Skinner. But one thing that you want to think about as you're searching, even just searching by name, is playing with different search terms. So you could search like I did using first name and surname, like George Skinner. If you have a, a name that is common or you know that you want to focus it to a specific location, you could do first name, surname, and place, such as searching for John Taylor, Indiana. Or you could search for James Ramsey, Pennsylvania, you know, having that name along with the name of the state, the name of the location where you want to find him. Another search term that I want you to think about is searching for just the surname and the word family. In this case, Peden family. That's exactly how I found that Bible record that I showed you just a moment ago. A lot of Bible records, and I think that Tamika is going to show you more of those, a lot of Bible records don't have all of the individual names in the catalog. It's just simply the Peden Family Bible. So if you do a search for Peden Family, that can help you turn up a lot of resources that are specific to that family. But of course, our ancestors are more than names. And the resources that we're going to find on DPLA aren't necessarily going to have each name that appears in that record appearing in the catalog. 
you know, just like when you go to your local library and you look up something in the catalog, you don't necessarily find everything by that ancestor's name. So think about other ways that you can find resources that could have information about your ancestor. Think about locations. Where did your ancestor live? Looking up by location can yield tremendous results on DPLA. But also think about groups and organizations, the churches that your ancestors attended, the schools that they attended, what social or fraternal organizations did they belong to, what military units did they serve in. Any of these types of groups and organizations, they could have published histories, published rosters, they could have manuscript materials, correspondence, digitized photographs, there could be anything. But you want to think about searching for your ancestor in these broader terms, not just your ancestor's name. So let's take a look at searching by location. Now, I have ancestors in Jay County, Indiana. So I thought, okay, well, let's just go ahead and see what DPLA can discover for me about Jay County, Indiana. And when I put in that search term, and I got 774 results. And you can see just from the first three that we have both digitized, uh, in this case, we have a digitized map. We also have digitized county histories. I could click through and actually read these old county histories about Jay County, Indiana. As we go further down the results list, there are, of course, digitized photographs, there are oral histories, there's any number of types of materials that I found just by doing this search simply for Jay County, Indiana. When there's something that I'm interested in, like this map that we see here at the top, when I click on that and I get that more full result page, showing me that this is coming from the Indiana Memory Project at the Indiana State Library. I have the subject headings, but again, the real magic is that link that I want to click through so that I can see this digitized map. And when I do that, it takes me again away from DPLA and directly to that resource, this digitized Jay County, Indiana map that's on the Indiana Memory Project website. And what I really like about this particular resource, and I think it shows why we need to think about searching more than just the name, is when we zoom in on this map, we can see the names of all of the property owners in Jay County, Indiana around the year 1900. There are so many names here, but they're not in the record, not, they're not in the catalog record. So if I did a search for, let's say, Carolyn Robeson or C. Alexander or Diane Alexander, those searches aren't going to give me this map. I had to think more broadly about something other than a name. And by searching by location, we can find these wonderful digitized records that are available that have our ancestor's name is just not in the catalog, so we need to look more broadly. I do a lot of Civil War research. So one of the things that I like to do on DPLA is look for not only the name of the veteran, but also look for the name of his regiment. Now, when I did a search for the 3rd Minnesota Infantry, I got 216 results. Now, that's a lot of results, and I was really, really excited. As I started to go through them, I noticed a couple of things. I noticed that in the results, as we have here, that these photographs, some of them were circa 1918. And then I realized what was going on. This wasn't just the 3rd Minnesota Infantry from the Civil War. I was also getting results of the 3rd Minnesota Infantry from the Spanish-American War 
as well as the 3rd Minnesota Infantry from World War I. So how can I take these 216 results? I really only want the Civil War records. I, I really don't want the ones from World War I or the Spanish-American War. Well, you may have noticed over on the left on the results page, there are the different sections where you can refine the search. Those little links, they're called facets. And what they will do is once you have done a search, you can click on one of those facets, whether it's one of the subjects, one of the locations. As you scroll down the page, you'll also see things for the contributing institution, as well as other ways that you can narrow your search. So in this case, I have all these results for the 3rd Minnesota Infantry, but I really just want the results that deal with the Civil War. So what I can do is over here on this left-hand side of the page, I can go ahead and click that link to Civil War, and it will narrow this result set. So now, instead of 216 results, when I click on Civil War, I now have 57. It's a lot fewer results, but the results that I have are more meaningful for my research. I would rather go through 57 results that mean something than try to sort through those 214, where a lot of them really aren't what I'm looking for. So use those facets over there on the left-hand side to narrow down your search. With DPLA, as I mentioned, we see so many different types of materials. And what we have here, just on, on these three that you can see, we have not only digitized photographs, but also an actual scan of the battle flag of the 3rd Regiment of Minnesota Infantry. So it isn't just those, those photographs and those books, you also can find three-dimensional objects as well. I have a colleague who actually found her ancestor's Civil War journal, um, the journal and the carrying case that had been digitized by a historical society. That was a great find for her. So think about not only for names, but also locations and groups and organizations and other topics that are pertinent to your ancestor. And at this point, let's go ahead and turn it over to Tamika Strong, who's going to show us more about the different types of records that we can find in DPLA for our genealogy. Thanks, Amy. Know how to search DPLA. Let's look at some of the things you can actually find in DPLA. Are my slides showing up okay? Uh, yes, we can see them. Okay, great. All right, so <clears throat> as Amy said, there are a lot of collections contained in DPLA that will assist genealogists in doing their family history research. And so typically for genealogists, our research begins at home. And so there are several home resources that we have available to us that we should start with. And luckily for some of us, for those of us who don't have those things at home or who have not been gifted those trunks full of family Bibles, family papers, and other things, DPLA and its partners have those resources, have made those resources available to us. So for the home resources, we're going to take a look at what they have to offer in way of you know, oral histories, family Bibles and papers, funeral programs, military records, photos, and yearbooks. First, we're going to start out with fam the oral histories. Oral histories come in many different forms and fashions. They could just be a happenstance conversation. They can be a purposeful interview with a family member. Or it could be um, the intentions of a group of people to capture the story of an individual and their um, experiences in life, like the case here with the oral history for Ms. Ethel Bolden, provided to us by the Richland Library in Columbia, South Carolina, via the South Carolina Digital Library. In her oral history, Ms. Bolden talks about 
growing up in the segregated South, as well as pursuing a career in librarianship during segregation. And one of the great things about this resource is not only do you get a chance to see and hear Ms. Ms. Bolden speak, but you also have the opportunity of reading the transcript alongside of her oral history. So hey, that was Tamika. one of the great things about that resource. Hey, Tamika, this is Kenny. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, um, I think we're seeing um, uh, some notes. You're seeing the other screen. one? Yeah, is that okay? Would you mind um, making your screen full screen a little bit more? There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. See, I wondered about that. So no, it's, okay. it's okay. You're all good. Thank you. Okay. Great. So <clears throat> now we're going to move on to the next collection of family Bibles. Family Bibles for many people contain a lot of great information, and if you can uncover one of these in your family, um, they are to be treasured. But you may have a situation where the family Bibles are held by one of those relatives who refuse to let you see it, who probably don't even really want you to know they have it. And so there are some cases where instead of passing it down in, within the family, that individual may end up sharing it with the institution. As with the case with the Hobbes Family Bible, where Mr. John Herman Hobbes decided he wanted to share their 200-year-old family Bible with the Tennessee State Library and Archives. And so by doing so, he made sure that <clears throat> it would be available um, to generations. But the Tennessee State Library and Archives took it one step further, and they digitized it so that now the world can see different pages from their family Bible and learn more about his family, including the birth date of Miss Loretta Hobbs, who was born July 28, 1895. Mr. J.H. Hobbs, who was born January 26, 1893, and Ms. Sophia Hobbs, who was born December 22, 1896. Not only are there family Bibles contained in the Digital Public Library of America, but there are also family papers. And these family papers could be a number of things. They could be birth, marriage, death records, they can be letters, they can be journals, they can be other things. And so for the case of the Morrison family, there are um, examples of bodies that were shared. And an example of that <coughs> is this list of births where we can see that Richard Leland Morrison was born October, October 1st, 1871, and Lucinia Rebecca Morrison was born April, I think that's 25th, 1873. And from this page, you can also learn a little bit more, including baptismal, baptismal information when they were baptized and by who Richard was baptized by. Now, this next collection is one of my favorites. I love funeral programs. I know that sounds morbid, but funeral programs um, provide a great deal of information um, for the person who is deceased and also clues about the person's family. Funeral programs for some cultures, especially in the African American culture, are um, pretty popular and it's something that most people, um, if they can afford them, actually do. And for some people, these funeral programs represent the only written biographical information they will ever have. And so that's why funeral programs are very, very important. And the thing about funeral programs is that you, they may not be where you think they should be. And they may not be listed under the person's name. As the case with our example here, Annie Mefeters, who was one of the first African-American librarians in the city of Atlanta, donated her collection to the Auburn Avenue Research Library. And amongst her papers, were um, funeral programs for several, several individuals, one of which is Miss Dolly Sophie Bridges. So Miss Sophie Bridges, um, excuse me, Miss Dolly Bridges, we learn when she died, well, excuse me, we learn when she was buried and where her, her services were held and who officiated her funeral. We also learn that where she was interred, Southview Cemetery, as well as some other information like who were the caretakers of her body. However, 
with some of these records, you never really know what you're going to get because there may be some little extra pieces that the person who had the document may have added to the record. Case in point, the handwritten note about Ms. Bridges where she is the mother of the founder of the Cottage Churches. This right here serves as a clue that can help a researcher with regards to the Bridges family find more information about um, their family. But the golden piece of the funeral program is the obituary. Now the obituary can include as much information or as little information as a person or whoever the author of the obituary plans to include. Her obituary includes her name, where she was born, the date she was born, where she attended church, talks about her marriage, how many children were born to her union, and a lot about her religious beliefs in her religion. However, some obituaries will include information about the parents, the grandparents, where the people, where the person went to school, where they worked, where they served in church, and some other information, including the names of their children as well as their spouses, as well as surviving members of the family. So when you find an obituary, or as they're also known as obituaries in the African American culture, but when you find funeral programs, they are to be treasured and to be kept and not to be thrown away, which unfortunately is the fate of some of them that don't get passed on to generations like some of the families in African American culture do. Next collection, military records. These are some fun records because you learn a lot about the person who is um, serving in the military. As is the case with the volunteer enlistment paper for Ms. Finney Wells, which we found through the Minnesota Digital Library thanks to the Nicolet County Historical Society. From his enlistment records, we learned that Mr. Wells was not born in Minnesota. He was actually born in Clinton County, New York. So this is a case where if a person is looking for him in New York, they may not find any information, but he's actually in Minnesota. So location is important. But if a person was interested in seeing the original document, there's a few clues on this document to show them where it, the original document is held. Take note of the handwritten note at the very top of the document, which is really cool because his signature is on this document, so to be able to touch the document that your ancestor touched is really a big deal for a lot of researchers. Our next collection is one that is very popular, and most of us have quite a few of these lying around the house, and these are photographs. Photographs are the more visual collections that a researcher will um, will use in their research. And they can also be served as a great conversation starter with some of your ancestors, not, excuse me, some of your relatives. Because maybe you have some photos in your collection that you don't, you're not able to identify some of the people in there. And so if you take it to an elder in your family, this may be <clears throat> a way to encourage them to tell you more about the people in the image and then you'll be able to identify them. And then also with photographs, there are also clues that can also help you to identify something about the individuals contained within a photograph. Case in point, in this photograph, the gentleman standing here has a medal or a badge on his shirt. And I try to enlarge it. But if there are more powerful scanners out there, which there are, and I think this is such a great, this photo is such great quality that you can enlarge it to try to get some of the finer details about the metal, you may be able to identify the service or the branch of government, the branch of the military that he served, which may help to provide more clues about who he is. Another collection that we can find in DPLA are yearbooks. And most of us have these yearbooks. And yearbooks come in different styles, different formats. I just recently learned that um, high school now are not doing the paper format, they're doing more digital yearbooks. And I was kind of disappointed with that because 
part of your high school experience is getting the yearbook and having it signed by your friends and um, your teachers. But we're lucky to have some yearbooks and we're lucky to have creators or institutions like Attleboro High School who know the value in digitizing yearbooks. And they have done so for several of their classes. And so for our example here, we have a copy of their 2008 yearbook. Imagine the uh, students from this class when they can look online and actually see their yearbook. I have a very interesting yearbook story myself. I was volunteering at the Archives Division of the Auburn Avenue Research Library and as a volunteer I was able to see behind the scenes and get to know um, several of the collections that they have available. One of their collections is of yearbooks of African American high schools in the city of Atlanta. And lo and behold, I looked at the, on the shelf and found two yearbooks for my family. And that actually um, contained members of my family in them. So I was really excited. And one thing that I did learn about that yearbook was that they also included the address of where that, that family member lived at the time of the yearbook. And so yearbooks have some great information in them. And so hopefully, um, you will be able to find some yearbooks that will help you with your family search. Now, we all know when doing research, you can't stay at home to find everything. You have to go outside. And so DPLA also have what I consider outside resources available to researchers. And these resources include church records, cemetery records, newspapers, maps, ebooks, and more. Thanks to the contributing institution, the Library of Congress and Hathi Trust, we we're able to see early records from the church at Topsville in Massachusetts. And we know that there's a certain amount of, there's a certain time period in which the government started taking um, vital records. But before the government was taking records, the church maintained records. And so thanks to them, we we're able to see the records from this church from 1684. Now the only problem I have with this record is the fact that the wives of the men listed here are not listed by name. But that's just my hang up. But the problem with that mindset is that I'm putting a 21st century mindset on a 17th century situation. And that's not good. We have to make sure that when we're looking at these records, we want to try to keep them in their historical context so that we can um, be mindful of the societal norms. So for them, listing the wife as they have it listed here was the norm, whereas today you would normally see the wife's name. In addition to church records, we have cemetery records. And for this example, the death records from Elwood Cemetery provided by the University of Michigan through Hathi Trust, this example is great in the sense of it lists the interments as they are laid out in the cemetery. In some of the records, you might see an index where they're organized by the last name of those who were interred. And by doing that, you lose the context of the grouping because in those groupings, there may be some relatives that are laid to rest nearby. And so by organizing them by last name, if the last names are different, you will probably miss some relatives. So I really like this example. Newspapers. I love newspapers, especially with um, finding information about the bad girls and the bad boys in your family history. If there's something, some skeletons in the closet or there's a black sheep in the family and they did something in the community, newspapers are the place to go find that information. And so although not all the information in the newspaper about your relatives may be bad, but there may be something there. One of the great things about DPLA is not only do they provide mainstream newspapers, but they also provide ethnic newspapers, as is the case with our example here of the Charlotte, Charlotte Jewish News out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And it looks like through the digital Carolina, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, 
with assistance from the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Charlotte, they have the full run of this newspaper available to anyone who is interested in learning more about the Jewish community in Charlotte. One of the coolest finds that I uncovered in DPLA that really got me excited about this um, project was uncovering maps planning maps or from the Bureau of Planning from Atlanta, Georgia that were provided by Georgia State University and special collections um, in their libraries through the Digital Library of Georgia. As an Atlanta native, this is really exciting for me because these maps capture the places where my family lived, worked, and played. But one of the great things about this collection is once you are transported over to the GSU um, site, you're able to take that historical map and place it on top of a current Google map. And then once you do that, in the upper right, you're able to make it transparent so that you're able to see what is currently in that space. So with this functionality, you're able to see what was there and what is currently there. And I thought that was really interesting so that you can actually see the place where your ancestors or family members worked or played or did with that, whatever as it is today. But you know that back in the mid-70s or even earlier, there was something else there. And so you're walking in the footsteps of your ancestors. Last but not least, ebooks. Gotta love ebooks. So I did something that Amy told you guys about, a location search. So my research is primarily in Georgia. So I just typed in Georgia counties. And lo and behold, two books, two ebooks came up, one of which is something that is very interesting in the sense of it talks about the counties and their boundaries and how they change. And so that one is the Georgia counties, they're changing boundaries. And now I'm really excited about this because one of the things as genealogists that we have to do is get familiar with the history of the counties in which our ancestors lived. And this book will help us do that. It also help us um, learn when the boundaries change so that we'll know that when we look at the census record, if our family was in one city one census year and the next year they're in another city, whether or not the city they moved or the county boundary line moved. And so I'm really excited about this resource, so much so that I plan to share it with all of my Georgia genealogy researchers after this session. And if you haven't heard already, the ebook collection in DPLA is about to explode because of a partnership between, between DPLA and Family Search. And through that partnership, researchers through DPLA will have access to more than 200,000 family history and genealogy ebooks. So we're not sure when that's going to happen, so stay tuned for more information about that initiative. And so I did mention earlier that there are more collections. There are a ton more. So much so that I just added a few more, but I'm sure that doesn't even cover everything. And so some of the ones that may be of interest to you may be plantation records, bills of sale of enslaved people, these and land records, court records, genealogies and family trees. How cool is that to be able to find a family tree already done? That will be gold. Um, ship manifests, passenger manifests, as well as information about various institutions. And so, as you can see, I've only scratched the surface, so please take time to take a look at DPLA and do some searches, play, play around with it. I think you will learn a lot just like I did. But before I turn it over to Kenny, I want to leave you with some tips. A wise person once told me to remember this question when doing my genealogy and other things. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a, one bite at a time. Genealogy can be a lifelong, overwhelming exercise. But as long as you take your time, take one bite at a time, you will achieve your goals that you set for yourself. Be prepared for the good, 
the bad, the ugly, and the unbelievable. Sometimes truth, fact, is stranger than fiction. But with that, you have to keep an open mind about what you learn. You have to take history for what it is. Don't try to put a 21st century mindset on an 18th, 17th, 19th century situation. You have to keep things in their historical context so that you can have a better understanding of the lives that your ancestors lived. Come back and visit DPLA often. Collection, collections are always being added, so something that may not be there today may show up in a collection next week. Make sure to spread the word, the word about DPLA. We want to get the word out and want to have more people using it so that we can encourage more collections to become a part of it. And last but not least, keep calm, have fun, and research on. So I just want to thank you guys for joining us this afternoon, and I want to turn it, turn it over to Kenny. Thank you, Tamika. That was excellent. Um, so we are now going to take a look at the questions that we've been receiving over the uh, chat box. If you happen to have some now, please feel free to type them in. Uh, we're definitely not going to be able to get through all of them. There are quite a few. Um, but as I mentioned, we will do our best to answer them after the fact offline and share them to you via um, um, uh, email and post it to our workshops uh, page. So the Sorry, just one moment. Okay, there we go. So the first question I have here um, is, how does DPLA's coverage differ from OCL OCLC's WorldCat and Archive Grid? I should also say, Samantha, Tamika, um, and Amy, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, I'll do my best to direct these as needed. But for this question, um, I think the key thing to recognize is DPLA provides instant access to fully digital items. Everything in DPLA is instantly available online. Um, as, as, as Amy and Tamika showed, you just click that view object button or view this, uh, this item in um, Contributing Archive and it instantly takes, it to, takes you there. Um, whereas WorldCat and Archive Grid are connecting you to um, physical objects uh, in archives, libraries, across the country. So these items um, aren't necessarily instantly available online. In DPLA, all 3.3 uh, 3 million items are instantly viewable online, many of which you can um, use and download. Which leads me to the second question, building off that. Someone asked, are these items copyright free? There are many, many, many items that are copyright free. Um, not all of the items in DPLA are copyright free, though they are um, publicly accessible, publicly viewable. There are um, rights fields for each item. So each item in DPLA has sort of um, a rights statement associated with it that will let you know um, what the status of that object is. Many, many, many items are in the public domain, which means you can reuse them, and pull them down into your own um, sort of collections. Those that are under copyright will explain um, if they are, but as I mentioned, all the items are going to be viewable in your browser um, right then and there. And here's a question. Since the majority of my ancestors lived their whole lives in Maryland, is it even worth it to search for them in the DPLA, DPLA collections? Maryland wasn't listed as a state with current collections slash partnerships. Um, that is a good question. Uh, Though Maryland is perhaps not represented in our contributing institutions currently, that does not mean that there are not um, collections or items related to Maryland held in other libraries, archives, and museums that are in DPLA. Um, the coverage and scope of the collections in DPLA is global, though we are um, collecting from US-based institutions at this time. Um, also, we are always formulating new partnerships and working with states to get them online in DPLA. So while your state may not be represented at the current time, um, it's very likely that in the next uh, few months or year, um, it will be. Um, but as I mentioned, the collections are, are global in scope. So though you might not see um, uh, your state represented in our list of contributing hubs, that does not mean that there aren't items or collections related to um, your area. All right, 
I'm sorry, I'm just cruising through the list here. It's pretty long. Um, this one might be for Tamika or Amy. Are any of the digitized images of items um, such as plate maps and cemetery records searchable? Um, I think that's a question about full text. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, that's this. This is Amy. That's that's a really good question. Discovering them through DPLA really depends upon how they were entered by that particular library, archives, museum, whatnot. So while they may not be full text searchable through DPLA, um, what you what you sometimes will find, and this is not every case, but sometimes when you click through, you will discover that 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 material, especially if it's like you know something that's like a county history, something that's been um, digitized and run through OCR, you might be able to do a full text search. So it, it's kind of a two-step thing. First, you have to discover it, and you might have to discover it through doing doing something like a location search or a, a subject search. But then once you get into the material, depending on how that institution digitized it and what processes they've done to it, you might be able to do a full text search after you discover it. Thanks, Amy. OK. Um, just clicking the list here. Question here, and there are actually a, a number of similar questions. Um, how can we submit materials we have, such as family Bibles, funeral home programs, et cetera, to DPLA? There are other questions about um, contributing materials to DPLA. So as, as Samantha mentioned, as we've talked about previously, um, DPLA works through a network of contributing institutions that are um, based in individual states. Um, if you go to um, our website under hubs, you can see a list of all of the currently operational DPLA hubs. Um, there is also contact information there for um, representatives from these individual um, state-based hubs. They can point you in the right direction. We don't deal with, or we don't do um, sort of individual donations or contributions to DPLA. Rather, they're mediated through these state-based um, aggregators or, or digital libraries representing a state or region. So if you notice that there is someone in your state or region who is an active DPLA hub, I would encourage you to get in touch with them. They very well may be able to put you in touch with um, someone locally or um, historical society, library, archive who would be interested but they're probably your best point of contact um, in terms of potentially seeing your materials or um, your, your, your library or archives materials in DPLA. Um, here's a question about conducting some family research. How do you find regiment information? I have relatives that were in the military but don't know that info. Amy or Tamika, do you happy, happen to know any suggestions or tips for identifying um, where, you know, a, a family member's um, regiment information who might have served in the past? This is Tamika. I think it really depends on when they served and if they can identify what war they may have served in or at what point they were registered. Like, you may want to do a search to see if they have a war, World War One or World War II draft card, or just look at any of the um, different muster rolls and different things like that. So you may want to do a search in Ancestry or Family Search, which have extensive military records, as well as DPLA to see if you can uncover them. But the key is to figure out what um, war happened during their lifetime to see if that, that could provide them with um, a clue as to where they served. And, and this is Amy, just to follow up on what Tamika said. Um, don't overlook sources that you might have at home, thinking about things like obituaries, um, family letters, um, tombstone. Of course, you're not going to have the tombstone at home, but you know, it's just it's another source that could actually list his, his regiment. For older wars, such as especially the Civil War, a lot of county histories actually listed the regiments of the men from that county who served. So if 
if that happens to be what war you're thinking of, definitely take a look at those older county histories. You might be surprised what you'll find in those. Um, so I think we have time for just maybe one or two questions more. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot here, so we'll do our best to answer them after the fact and post them online. Um, how, one question is, how is DPLA funded? Um, so DPLA is currently funded by grants from um, a variety of foundations, ranging from um, places like the National Endowment for the Humanities to the Institute of Museum and Library Services to the Sloan Foundation and the Knight Foundation. So right now, DPLA is funded um, uh, by, uh, by grants and foundations, but we are actively developing a sustainability model that will allow um, DPLA to be sustainable beyond these grant uh, funds, which, which we are um, working on currently. Um, another question, will you have reps at Roots Tech 2017? Yes, we will. Um, we are going to be um, uh, at a booth at Roots Tech coming up. Um, we also have a proposal in to give a presentation, waiting to hear back on that, but at the very least, we will definitely be there at a booth, so please come find us, grab some DPLA swag. We'll have bookmarks and stickers and all kinds of stuff, so you'll want to grab some of that and say hi to some of our staff members. Question, will you do more workshops? Um, yes, uh, we, we have a, a series of workshops. This is one part of a, um, a series where we talk about things related to DPLA in our community, um, but we certainly are interested in doing more genealogy or family research workshops. We will announce those types of workshops over our mailing list, on our workshops page, over Twitter and Facebook. So please keep your, keep, uh, your eyes peeled for that um, as they come out. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. It is now 3.59. Um, I wanted to first of all thank Amy and Tamika for speaking with us today about how DPLA can be used for genealogy and family research. They did an excellent job, and we um, very much appreciate their efforts. And I'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. Um, over the next few days, we are going to process the recording of this webinar and answer any of the questions we weren't able to get to. We will post these materials to our workshops page as soon as they are ready, as well as email them to you directly. We will also include links to um, the collections that Tamika was able to highlight in her uh, presentation, so we will include those links in that email as well. Um, we will also in the email include a very brief survey, so if you have time and ability, please take a moment to fill it out so we can improve the DPLA workshops um, going down, but down the road. So I want to thank everyone again for joining us today, and please have a great day. Take care.